Southwinds Church. Welcome to our online service, and we're so glad you're here. My name is Marco Marin, and I have the privilege of serving as your student ministry pastor. Right now, you're joining hundreds, potentially thousands of people all across our city, nation, globe, worshiping Jesus' name together. Are you watching for the first time? If you are, we'd love to connect with you. There's a couple ways you can do that. One way is by downloading our new church app or by texting Southwinds to 33777. There you can stay up to date with all things Southwinds, fill out a connect card to help us connect with you. We know this season is uncertain and difficult. And as we work through the book of Philippians, we're learning about how God calls us to choose joy and contentment no matter what our circumstances are. And we'd love to hear your story. Even the most simple choices, like choosing gratitude or, an, or enjoying that extra time with our children, are stories that can bring light to others. By texting Southwinds to 33777, you can do just that. You can tell us about how you are being joyful. We'll be sharing these stories on Instagram and Facebook over the next several months, so be sure to follow along with us on social media to hear those stories. Life group season is in full gear, and wouldn't it be great to know you're not alone and you can have an opportunity to join a life group with people just like you. If you're not signed up for one yet, that's okay, it's not too late. Simply go to our Southwinds app, click on connect, and follow the links to join a life group. If you have any questions, simply email our life group team at lifegroups at southwinds.org or cmartinez at southwinds.org and they'll get back to you as soon as possible. As part of our Breakthrough Spiritual Initiative, Southwinds Church is partnering with the American Red Cross. If you're interested in donating blood this upcoming week, follow the information below to sign up. And because of your generosity, we're able to continue partnering with our neighbors in Tracy, Mountain House, and Lathrop. As always, you can give online at southwinds.org forward slash giving, if, where you can give from your phone by texting Southwinds to 33777, where you can set up a one-time gift or reoccurring gifts. Thanks again for tuning in and joining us this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness and join us now as we continue to worship the Lord and Savior together. Well, hello, Southwinds family. It's great to be together again. You know, God's in our midst today and there's power in our praise for Him. So no matter where you're at, let's give us a praise. Let's worship. Let praise be a weapon. Let praise be a weapon. Let silence seize the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with the Cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift Him on. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, 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 we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. I let faith be strong. 
you for your goodness. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your love for us. We give you our lives and we give you our hearts. And all God's people said, Amen. Welcome to Southwinds Online. I hope you have your Bibles out, and as always, you can download message notes from our app and follow along. This is week two of our study in Paul's letter to the Philippians called Joyful. You know, in every season of life, God wants his people to be people of joy. But how much more crucial is joy in this time that we're living through? Today, we're going to be looking at the essential role that our minds play in experiencing a joy-filled life. And I'm calling this message A Beautiful Mind, because joy comes far more from how we think than how we feel. Joyful people think differently. They see life from God's perspective. They, they always think, whatever happens to me, God has a plan and is in control. They always ask, what is God doing in my life right now? And as a result, they can know joy and peace no matter what happens. The kind of life that joy-filled people live, the kind of life we all want to live, it always begins with how we think. And, and the way that joyful people think, well, that shows up most clearly whenever they face problems. I want to encourage you to turn to Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And we're going to look at two key passages in Philippians 4 before we get to our main text, because I want you to see how Paul thought. He was a human being like us, yet he thought about life and its challenges in a way few of us do. And Paul writes this, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now just stop there and let me ask you, does that make sense to you? How reasonable is it to tell someone they should never worry? I mean, how could Paul say that? Well, it had to do with how he thought. See, if you're, you're going to do what Paul says, you will need two things. And the first thing you will need is a problem, because if you never have a problem, you never have the opportunity to learn how not to worry. So how many of you have at least one problem or you know where you can get one? How many of you are sitting next to someone who looks like they have a problem? How many of you are sitting next to your problem? We think anxiety is caused by our problems. So we say, you know, if God wants me to worry less, he should just give me fewer problems. But it doesn't work that way. Joyful living is far more about how we think. A psychologist named Albert Ellis came up with a model for understanding how people respond to life's problems. And it's called the ABCs of emotional life. Let me show it to you. A stands for antecedents. These are the things that happen to us. These are my circumstances or my situation. C stands for consequences. These are the outcomes of my circumstances. And Ellis says the great illusion in life is that what happens to me, my circumstances, well, that controls what I feel. So if good things happen to me, like I get a raise or it's a nice day or someone pays me a compliment, then I feel good. But if something bad happens, I'm down. I'm I'm at the mercy of my circumstances. But in between the antecedents and consequences, Ellis says is B, which stands for my beliefs about what happened to me. It's my beliefs about what has happened to me that ultimately determines the outcome. It's my beliefs that determine the way I feel. And this is why two different people can be in precisely the same situation, can experience identical circumstances, and yet still have diametrically opposite responses because they have different beliefs. For example, this is the difference between cats and dogs. A dog looks at his circumstances and says, you feed me, you pet me. You shelter me. You care for me. You must be God. But a cat says, you feed me. You pet me. You shelter me. You care for me. I must be God. Same antecedents, different beliefs, completely different set of consequences. In Philippians 4.13, Paul tells us that what he believed about any circumstances that came into his life. Now, Paul is talking about the hardships he faces, and he makes this amazing statement, which which tells us how he thinks about life. Paul says this, 
I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Paul says, whatever I have to face, I can face because God is in control. God is working. God has a plan. And when you carry that conviction inside, there's nothing that can threaten the joy and peace that guard your mind because it's not about how good or bad your circumstances are. Here's the second thing that you will need to not be anxious about anything, and that is a renewed mind. The message title comes from the 2001 Oscar-winning movie starring Russell Crowe, and it was based on a best-selling book written earlier. Maybe you remember this was about the life of a brilliant Nobel Prize-winning physicist from Princeton who, who suffered all his life from paranoid schizophrenia. In this broken, fallen world, all of us struggle with our thoughts, with knowing sometimes what is true and, and what is false. And what I'm suggesting is when our minds know that God is always in control, then we can live lives filled with joy and peace. And then we can face whatever we have to face. And that is truly a beautiful mind. We're going to work our way through Philippians 1 verses 12 through 26. And I want to show you some of the contours of Paul's beautiful mind, how he thought, and the the kind of joy that his thinking unleashed in his very difficult life. Don't forget, Paul is writing this letter from prison. And remember, as I mentioned last week, that across his life, Paul experienced a constant physical pain he called his thorn in the flesh. He was tortured by government officials and imprisoned and shipwrecked multiple times. Rioting mobs beat him twice and his opponents slandered him repeatedly. And yet, Paul can still write these words in Philippians 4.4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Hard life, a beautiful, joy-filled mind. So let's explore Paul's mind, the the way that Paul thought. And here's the first thing I want you to see, what Paul thought about circumstances. One of the reasons Paul wrote the letter to the Philippians was because they'd ask how he was doing. I mean, how he was holding up mentally, how he was holding up emotionally. What about physically and spiritually? And and they loved Paul and, and Paul loved them. So he wanted them to know how he was doing. And and as he tells them, we get this amazing wisdom about how we can respond to our difficult circumstances. Look at verses 12 through 14, which say, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Here's Paul's situation. These are the antecedents in his life. He's in chains. He doesn't want to be in chains. He wants to be out preaching the gospel. And not only that, he doesn't know what the consequences of his chains will be. He says a little later on that he may die. And on top of that, as we will see in a few moments, there are some other Christ followers who who are out and they are preaching the gospel, but their motives are bad and they're trying to make Paul look bad. See, Paul has a lot of problems, but he also has a renewed mind. And he knows that the Philippians whom he loves, they've heard about his problems and they may be worrying about him. And that's why he writes in verse 12, I want you to know what has happened to me. This was a customary phrase used in personal letters back then. It usually came close to the greeting and it was an indicator that the writer was getting to the main thing he wanted to say. And what's noteworthy here is that this is the very first time that this phrase was used in a letter to a group of people. It just shows us how close Paul was to them. And what Paul tells them is that he thinks of his circumstances as ultimately good because he knows that God is working through them and using them. He says... What has happened to me, my imprisonment, has actually served to advance the gospel. And he speaks of two ways that the gospel is being advanced. First, Paul is able to witness to the Roman guards. Verse 13 tells us that the whole palace guard understands he's in chains for Christ. And there were up to 9,000 Roman guards, and Paul is telling them, all of them are talking about it. 
Paul was chained to a guard 24-7 and the, the soldiers would take shifts and Paul just keeps sharing the gospel. And when the Philippians heard this, I think they would have remembered what happened to Paul in Philippi when he was just starting the church there. And again, the story is in Acts 16. As Paul preached and Paul taught, he, he crossed some very powerful, wealthy people who had him arrested, stripped, beaten, severely flogged, thrown into prison where his feet are fastened in stocks. He only has Silas with him. He's far from home as Philippi was the first church in Europe. Now, I don't know about you, but if that happened to me while I'm trying to obey God by serving him, I kind of think some anxious thoughts might have formed in my mind. I, I kind of think I might have lost some joy and peace. But in Acts 16, 25, Luke tells us that around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And I love the detail Luke gives us. Paul and Silas are in prison. Remember, they've been beaten and flogged. It's the middle of the night, but they're praying and they're singing hymns to God. And I love this. Luke says the other prisoners were listening to them like they had a choice, like they could change the channel. I'll make an observation here. When a chain of obsessive worry starts to form in your mind, researchers say you have about a one minute window of opportunity to cut it off. And those of you who really wrestle with anxiety, you know that once it, it wraps its tentacles around you, you can be caught for hours or even days of obsessive worry. You have about one minute to get rid of it, to counteract it, to take some kind of decisive action that can shut it off. And that's what Paul does here. He talks to God, he starts singing, he worships God. And he discovers that prison is a perfectly safe place for him to be. Not because it's pleasant. He's in pain. He's been humiliated. But because nothing can separate him from the love of God. See, Paul saw his hard, painful circumstances not as obstacles, but as opportunities for the gospel. And so every time a new guard shows up to start his shift, Paul is thinking, I'm not chained to you. You're chained to me. Let me tell you about Jesus, how wonderful and beautiful and amazing he is. I mean, think about it. How else would the gospel have gotten to those people? The second way the gospel was advancing is Paul's boldness was contagious. As other believers learned about Paul's circumstances, they were being strengthened to speak boldly. And, and that's what verse 14 says. Believers had become confident in the Lord. They were daring all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. And so this tells us that now dozens and, and maybe hundreds of people are sharing Jesus boldly. And then God used what happened to impact the Philippians when they heard. And, and then God continued to use it down now through 2,000 years. God's using it today with us. You see, this is how Paul thought about his circumstances. All through the Bible, we see story after story of how God accomplishes his purposes, not in spite of hardship, but through hardship. Of course, the ultimate example of this is the cross of Christ. Just think about it. Nothing worse could ever happen than the world rebelling against its creator. But when God's son came in love, sinful people killed him out of hatred and pride. And yet, while the cross is the most ugly display of our sin, it's the most beautiful display of God's grace. There on the cross, Jesus took on our sin to wipe it away. There on the cross, Jesus won victory through his sacrifice. There on the cross, Jesus showed his perfect love and justice. And that's why Paul can be imprisoned, but still have the joy and the confidence of a free man. It's because of his faith in the crucified and risen Christ. And faith doesn't just mean believing in something you can't see. Faith is looking at things from a different perspective altogether. Paul was in prison, but he didn't think, I'm a captive. He thought, you're my captive audience. And Paul could think, you know, you didn't drag me to a place I didn't want to go. I was escorted to the place I wanted to go all along, to Rome, and I got there on Rome's dime. Paul can think, <laughs> your persecution isn't slowing Christ's mission. It's just advancing it even more. So what in our lives right now 
do we need to see from God's perspective? How do we need to think? What do you need to believe, which is to think, in order that God can work through your circumstances and advance the gospel? You know, we all have chains in our lives. But the real question is how we think about them and therefore how we will respond to them. And that is true even during a pandemic. Have you stopped to think lately what your sovereign father God might be doing in you through your hardships? Let's look at the second thing that we see about Paul's mind. And that's what Paul thought about adversaries. Look at verses 15 through the first part of verse 18. Paul writes, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Apparently, there were some people who followed Christ but weren't exactly in Paul's corner. And I don't think he was talking about false teachers. He had other words for that, and he always spoke very strongly against that. He's talking about Christians who are actually proclaiming the gospel, but their motives are off. And what's probably going on here is that in Paul's absence, there are some other preachers who are jockeying for position, fighting for prominence and worldly honor. And and so they're putting Paul down just to build themselves up. And we don't know the details. All we know is that they were trying to somehow take advantage of Paul's imprisonment to elevate themselves and undermine him. So how did Paul feel about this? Well, Paul's feelings can be captured in two words. Who cares? It's not that Paul didn't think motives in people's lives mattered. He wrote many times about that. What didn't matter to Paul was Paul. Someone's promoting Christ while putting him down. Who cares? As long as they were promoting Christ because it wasn't about him. It it wasn't about his ego, his reputation, his honor. It was all about Christ. You know, I think that this is also an important word for those of us who have been hurt by other Christians because it reminds us that Christ's body, the church, is imperfect at its best and sometimes damaging at its worst. It also reminds us that we shouldn't give up on the church and on Christ's mission because of sinful brothers and sisters. I just want to ask you, how much joy do you lose worrying and obsessing about the people who don't like you? the people who may try to put you down to to make you look bad so they can look good. Those people may not be preaching Christ, but you can stay focused on honoring him and honoring the gospel. You don't have to be derailed. You don't have to lose your joy. And it all comes down to how you think. See, if all that matters to you is Christ and his gospel advancing, well, in the end, who cares what other people think, what other people say? You can still be filled with joy. And when you think about this, one of the things it should remind us of is is this, that the gospel cannot be stopped. The gospel will advance. Again, God accomplishes his purposes, not in spite of hardship, but through hardship. We see in this text that the gospel cannot be stopped by imprisonment. The gospel cannot be stopped by opposition. The gospel cannot be stopped even when Christians sin. And we know today that the gospel cannot be stopped by disease or recession or anything else. God wants his gospel to advance and he wants to do that through us. It has to do with how we think. Here's the third thing as we explore Paul's mind. We see what Paul thought about himself. Let's keep reading. We'll start in the second half of verse 18 and read through verse 20. Yes, And I will continue to rejoice for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So what does Paul think about himself? We've seen that when it comes to whether he receives honor, he says, who cares? But when it comes to whether his life honors Christ, he says, 
That's everything. His number one goal is to live in such a way so as to not be ashamed of himself. And the way he could be ashamed was to live in such a way as to bring shame on Christ. How does this play out? He says, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. And we see there that defiant joy that despite imprisonment, despite his adversities, he says, I will choose joy. And then verse 19 tells us he's trusting that God is in control. And and so he's confident that through the Philippians prayers and through the help that the Holy Spirit gives him that all his circumstances will result in his deliverance. He says, I know my deliverance is coming. Now, when we read that, we would probably think he's talking about getting out of prison. But the word deliverance here is actually the same word that's usually translated salvation. And it's a term that's often used for ultimate deliverance. And we know that he's not just talking about getting out of prison because verse 20 tells us Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. It's like he's saying, whether I get delivered from prison or get delivered into eternal life, I'm going to get delivered. A little over a year ago, Tony Evans, a famous African-American pastor in in Dallas, Texas, lost his wife, Lois, to cancer. Last January, I saw the funeral service online and it was amazing. I, I heard his son, Jonathan Evans, speak about wrestling with God about how God had not answered his prayers and and asking God why with all the prayers prayed by so many thousands of people for his, his mom's healing, why had God not answered? Jonathan said, it was as if the Lord just then said to him, just because I didn't answer your prayer your way doesn't mean I didn't answer your prayer anyway. He said, and then God said to him, because of the victory that I have given you, there was always only two answers to your prayers. Either she was going to be healed or she was going to be healed. Either she was going to live or she was going to live. Either she was going to be with family or she was going to be with family. Either she was going to be well taken care of or she was going to be well taken care of. Victory belongs to me because of what I've already done for you. The two answers to your prayers are always yes and yes. Paul understood that. And that's why whether he lived or whether he died was not of ultimate significance to him. Paul knew the truth. It's not about you. And that's why he had a beautiful mind. Let me show you the final thing that we see about Paul's mind. What Paul thought about life itself. We'll pick up the reading in verse 21 where Paul writes, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Now, as a prisoner in chains for his faith, Paul didn't know whether he was going to live or die, whether he was going to be eventually released or executed. But he did have a singular thought about his life on earth. Paul's mind worked in a way that was life-changing because for Paul, when it came to life and death, he was in a no-lose scenario. Live, die, no matter. Both were fine. Why? Because to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that single line really is stunning when you think about it. And it is so true. To live is Christ. It's to be in relationship with Christ, to be on mission for Christ, to have the privilege of serving Christ and to die even better. Why? Because to die just means more of Christ. Full union with Christ, full intimacy with Christ, freedom from sin and pain and eternity in heaven and everything heaven has to offer. As C.S. Lewis once wrote, this life is just shadows. Real living hasn't even begun yet. 
But that's not all. To die, Paul thought, was gain because if he was martyred, it would fuel the early Christian movement even more. And so what Paul is saying to the Philippians is, I may die. I I just want you to know that. And that, it didn't happen. Not right after Paul's words that he wrote here. But eventually, that is exactly what happened because Paul was put to death in Rome. And part of what Paul's doing right here is he just faces this head on. He says, he says but, but here's what I think about that. If, if I get to live, on the one hand, I'll be connected to people I love. I'll, I'll get to hear about you and watch you grow and partner with you in God's kingdom. On the other hand, I could die and the Romans could kill me. And that sounds scary. Death is the enemy. But when I think about it, when Rome says they're going to kill me, What they're really saying is that they're going to send me to the place where there will be no more tears or sorrow, no more sickness or chains, where this thorn in the flesh I've been carrying around all of these years will finally be removed, where there will be no more guilt and no more regret and no more shame, where there is Jesus who for so long now I have served and I've seen through a glass darkly. I will then see him face to face where I will know an eternity of growth and delight, where every day will be brighter than the day that came before. That's their big threat. Oh, Rome, I am so scared. See, that's how Paul viewed life itself. That's how he thought. That was his mind. Maybe you could think about it like this. This is the the ABCs of Paul's spiritual life. And and I think it would be a good idea for each of us to make them our own. A was Paul's antecedent. Life is hard. B, Paul's belief. Jesus is Lord. C, Paul's consequence. I will rejoice. Life is hard. Jesus is Lord. Therefore, rejoice. I will rejoice. See, it all comes down to what you think. Is Jesus Christ Lord? Do you live your life in the hands of a great and good God? See, everything rides on that. And and friends, see it. This was Paul's mind. But it's often not our minds, is it? We don't think that way very often, do we? I mean, you know, death is the one thing we don't see as gain, We hold on to life. We cling to life. We we make death the great evil, death the great catastrophe, death the great loss. And even those who follow Christ sometimes act and feel this way. It's like we live as Christians, but we face death as if we're atheists. We're fighting it and we're mourning it as if it was the end. But Paul wasn't afraid of death because he knew that death is the doorway to eternal life. His confidence reminds me of the confidence of another believer in the fourth century, hundreds of years later. His name was John Chrysostom, and he was a great preacher and theologian in the early church. At one point in his life, the empress of the empire was threatening to banish him because of his faith and what he was preaching. And and here's what he said. It's, It's such an epic response. He said... If the empress wishes to banish me, let her do so, for the earth is the Lord. If she wants to have me sawn asunder, I will have Isaiah for an example. If she wants me to be drowned in the ocean, I think of Jonah. If I am to be thrown in the fire, the three men in the furnace suffer the same. If cast before wild beasts, I remember Daniel in the lion's den. If she wants me to be stoned, I have before me Stephen, the first martyr. If she demands my head, let her do so. John the Baptist shines before me. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I leave this world. He said, Paul reminds me, if I still pleased men, I would not be the servant of Christ. And friends, that is amazing. And it all came from how John Chrysostom thought It was kind of like, you know, you can't do anything to me and anything you try to do to me will just make me stronger. If you kill me, I get to go be with Jesus. If you let me live, I get to preach the gospel to more people. If you strip me naked, I'm clothed in Christ. If you take my money, I'm rich in Christ. If you take my life, Jesus gives me eternal life. It's it's like trying to blow out a fire and all you do is make the flames hotter. Hotter. 
south winds, I want you to know today that you don't have to be afraid even of death. Even in the middle of a pandemic where almost half a million people have died so far in our country, let me ask you, what if you got the coronavirus? What if you knew death was coming soon for you? Here's the thing, we're all going to die eventually. That's inevitable. So whether it's this week or next month because of the coronavirus, or whether it's years or decades later, we all have to face death. But because of the gospel, you don't have to be afraid of it. And you too can say, like Paul, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Now here's the truth. Paul would much rather die and be with Christ. That's his ultimate desire to know Christ fully and experience his presence eternally. But he ends up saying, it's not time for that yet. I need to stay. Why? Because there's still work to do. And so Paul wants to continue with this mission that God has given him. What does he mean when he says to live as Christ? Well, he points to three things in these verses that you should jot down. First, he means that it's a life of fruitful labor. That phrase fruitful labor in verse 22 has a lot of tension built into it because you know everyone wants fruit, but no one really wants to labor. We want joy and peace, but we don't want to sacrifice and serve. But fruit without labor is shallow. It, it doesn't last. That kind of fruit isn't very good. But on the other hand, labor without fruit is also not good. It just leads us to despair, working hard and seeing nothing. Living for Christ is to enter into this tension of fruitful labor, to know it's not supposed to be easy, that we live in a fallen world, and yet God is doing this beautiful work of redemption. And, and so we can embrace this tension. We can keep laboring. We can keep trusting that God will use our efforts to bear fruit. Second, it also means a life lived for others. Look at verse 24 again, where he says, it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Now, what I want you to notice is that Paul is thinking not about what's best for him, but what's best for others. And where would Paul get such a mindset? Well, the answer is Jesus, of course. Jesus is the one who laid his life down for others. Jesus is the one who called us all to deny self and follow his way of love. And that's exactly what Paul is doing. Third, it also means a life lived for joyful progress. Verse 25 says, I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. And I love that he puts progress and joy in the same breath here. These are two of the key themes in Philippians, progress and joy. But what's absolutely unique is the way these two are held together. I mean, where else do you see joy and progress together like this? Some of you might be thinking that they work together like this, that you know, there's joy at the end of progress, like you work hard and then you get the reward of joy. But what we're seeing here is that joy is not the finish line. Joy is the engine that gets us to the finish line. Joy compels us and moves us forward so that we can make progress for the kingdom and the glory of God. And that's what Paul actually says in verse 26, that, that this joy overflows into praise. Look at verse 26. He says, all of this so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. See, God's glory is not competing with our joy. Praise is actually the overflow of our joy. And when we delight in God and thank God and rejoice in God, that's worship. And so what Paul is doing and what we should do is we choose to worship through trials we choose to worship through this hardship we're facing right now. We choose to rejoice even in the midst of a pandemic because we see how good God is and we see how good he's been to us. And this is where I want to remind you. I want to remind you of what our true source of joy is, that we can have a joy beyond circumstances or beyond health or even beyond wealth because our joy is rooted in Christ and what he has done for us. And it's the gospel. It's the gospel that brings us this joy. It's going to cultivate joy in you more and more and more throughout your life as you contemplate it. And so let me close by reminding you, or maybe for some of you, those of you who haven't heard this yet, let me proclaim to you this good news of great joy. That while we were still sinners, 
when we rebelled against God and thought we were smarter than him and we were trying to do things our own way and when all we had ever done was work ourselves into a mess, God sent his son for us. God responded with mercy and love and and his son Jesus lived a perfect life. He was perfectly just, he was perfectly kind and perfectly loving. He did everything for the glory of God. And yet Jesus took that perfect life and he offered it up as a sacrifice for us. Jesus died on the cross, not for himself. He didn't have any sin to die for. He died for our sins. He was our substitute on the cross. He took our place and he bore our punishment so that we could have life, true life, eternal life. He died so that we might live. And then God the Father raised him from the grave. He's alive today. And so Jesus isn't just a historical figure we look back on. He's a living savior that we can know today. And our joy comes from him. And so since he's alive, our our source of joy is unending and abundant. So I wanna call you today, look to Jesus, trust in Jesus. You need him especially in hard times like these, knowing that that trusting in Christ in hard times, it produces the strength and perseverance and endurance. It, It produces the growth in our lives. Would you look to him? Would you trust him? I wanna ask you now, if you would bow your heads and we're just gonna pray together as we close this time. Father God, we thank you today that, Lord, through the gospel, even death has been defeated. And we recognize that while there is much suffering and much hardship in this life, we do not need to be driven by our fear because we can look to Christ in faith. God, I pray that for anyone right now who's hearing this, anyone who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray, God, that that hearing of, of death and sickness and maybe, maybe they're experiencing loss in their lives, I pray that in that they would look to you in this moment and they would say, Jesus, I trust you. I give you my life. I acknowledge that you died for my sins, that you rose from the grave. And God, I pray, I pray that you would give them the faith to see these realities, the faith to trust in you. I pray, Lord, that you would save them. Father, I pray for every single one of us that you would strengthen and increase our faith in these difficult times as we look to your son, Jesus, and as we live for him. Lord, I pray that we would all have the mind of Christ, that we would learn to think like Jesus, that we'd learn, Father, to think like Paul, and that through that mind, you would give us strength And we would be able to keep following you faithfully. That we would be able to live in joy. Joy because we know you, Jesus. You who are the only giver of true life and joy and peace. We pray all these things now as your children, Holy Father. In the name of your son, Jesus, who is our Lord and our Savior. And all God's people together, wherever you're listening, say, amen. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been so good to worship God together with you. We're praying that you'll have a blessed week, and we're looking forward to seeing you next Sunday. Have a great week in the Lord Jesus Christ. Rejoice in him. Amen. Amen.